Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The Moore Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. James Nussbaumer, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. James, uh, it is, as I say to many guests, an honor to have you on. Uh, but with yourself, obviously, you've only had your freedom um, uh, for the past few months right now. This, so this is a very um, different type of interview for me, for what you've been through. And um, we were just saying off, off, off air there that this is your first interview for the book. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and for that, I'm very grateful for, for the, uh, doing the first interview. It's not, ch you know, you, as an interviewer, you don't always get, you know, that opportunity to do that. And, and this is a fascinating book. Now, um, just tell the audience a bit about, uh, let's go back to 2007 and just explain very briefly um, what happened, um, uh, what some of the key points that happened there when, you, when uh, you were arrested, for example. Well, Kevin, uh, that all uh, <clears throat> swells big in my heart right now. My emotions are still not over this yet because I'm still trying to... Um, you know, regroup with uh, my newfound freedom, which is great. And first of all, before I go on any further, I do want to add that I thank you so much for having me on your show. I've looked forward to this all day long. And, you know, we chatted earlier and sent messages about, and uh, uh, I knew that uh, you were the, the man that I needed to give this interview to. And I've checked out your show, and it's uh, just amazing, your show. Well, what happened, Kevin, in uh, 2007? First of all, since I was about 25 years old, and I do want to say, since I'm mentioning that age, 25 years old, I've really noticed that the younger population is our group of people that's really moving forward. Uh, they're different people than when I was 25 years old, and they are taking charge, and they're good people. When I was 25 years old, I entered the financial services business as a stockbroker, financial advisor, insurance, all those things in the United States. And it's not really where I wanted to be, uh, but I entered into the business, you know, I married, car payments, houses, all that thing, and all of a sudden the business became me. I really didn't want to be there. Well, 25 years later, I made, which was 2007, I made the foolish mistake, a securities violation. I crossed uh, some lines, um, illegal lines, to recoup some, uh, re try to recover some uh, money that was left uh, 
gone by myself and, and many of us. And it was just, it was a foolish securities violation. Foolish on my part, I say foolish, and foolish also on, uh, I want to say, and not judgmental towards them, but uh, to the, the judge that sentenced me to a harsh 10 years in prison. But, you know, he shook the finger at me that I should have known better. But where my mind was at at the time that I did that was thought I was going to turn things around, thought I was going to make my life better by manipulating things and manipulating the system rather than just staying to the truth that's inside and going from there and doing what you really want to do. Well, it uh, came down on me pretty hard, pretty fast. And uh, all of a sudden, I had a lawyer that was, first of all, I was never... um, involved in uh, criminal activity before, so I didn't know what to expect in the judicial system. And I had a lawyer that knew that. Um, He was having a substance abuse problem himself. Of course, I would never mention his name. He died six months later after I went to prison from a cocaine overdose. And um, this was in the front page papers of the local prison. When I say local, it was about two hours south uh, driving time from where I'm at. And, you know, the, the, here was the front page news and all, you know, this was six months later. So I, I'm like, I had this lawyer that, you know, did, did me no good. And, and so anyway, so when, it was all understood by everybody that 10 years in prison for what I did, plus the money that people lost was repaid back. Now, I'm not saying that I've, that I did anything uh, that, in other words, I'm not saying that I was wrong with what I did is what I'm saying. And the 10 year harsh sentence, I don't hold against anybody. And everyone knew that it was that way, but that's the legal game, the way things are played out. And, and that's not any judgment that I'm passing on anyone either about that. But the point is in this country here in the United States, if you don't have a well-equipped attorney up against well-polished prosecutors and judges, that are that are de- determined to send you away, then you're going to go away. And that was the problem with me. I didn't have that on my side. So one thing led to another. I went to prison and um, had to pick up from my depression of everything that was going on before that then and decide what I was going to do. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let's ask the question then. Um, Prior, obviously, to the point of um, going to prison, had you or did you come across any sort? Had you had an interest in spirituality, or um, you know, ever considering if if you're more than your body, for example, if life sure. carries on when you pass on? Oh, absolutely, Kevin. Um, you know, I was raised um, a Catholic. I was an altar boy you know, and 12 years of Catholic education, and it was a great education. I still remember the, uh, the principal, at the, who's the principal of the school now, who was a, um, who was a, uh, a priest at, at the time he came into the school, and my year I graduated from high school was brand new out of the seminary. Now I hear he's the uh, school principal. But so anyways, I, I've had tremendous good people in the Catholic upbringing that really nothing against the Catholic upbringing at all. And I want to make that point clear. But I always had this thing that there was something more I needed to know. So when I got into the financial services business, um, you know, in any motivational type of field that you're in, you're always passed down by your superiors. Read these self-help books, read these. Well, I ran into a couple people. And is it okay if I mention their names that I've read their books? Please, please. Uh, Dr. Wayne W. Dyer, my favorite, Um, Deepak Chopra, and uh, especially Wayne Dyer. And the reason I bring that up, and there's more others, but I could go on and on. So, you know, I would read these people's self-help books and they would say, hey, well, you know, uh, these other people have other things good to say, too. And I always noticed one thing in all the books that all these people uh, were referring to me was this publication called A Course in Miracles. And I, I've i never been a procrastinator, but I decided not to investigate this Course of Miracles. I put it in the back of my mind and says, you know, what is this Course of Miracles? I, I was so down on myself and where I was going, but trying to pull myself up through self-help books. So I'd read again. 
A Course in Miracles, just a quote somewhere in a recommended by, say, Wayne Dyer, for example. But I never checked it out, thinking I will have to get to it. Why didn't I ever get to it? I don't know. I never got to it. One thing led to another. I kept reading the self-help books. I spiraled down. I was indicted. I ended up in prison. Uh, there was a, a situation that landed me in the hole called segregation. Everyone knows of the hole in prison. You see it on the movies. And really, it's pretty much like on the movies. Um, I was released from the hole, and I can maybe explain that a little bit later, but it was, uh, it was a gang activity that I was involved on. I was violently beat. But anyways, after that, I was recovering, laying on my top bunk in this double bunk community, 30 inches apart, all these bunks lined up down the way, and a fire alarm went off, and I decided I'm going to escape this fire and go, a fire alarm and uh, go into the library, which is right around the corner. So I go into the library, and I see... Wayne Dyer's book, Real Magic. Now, keep in mind, libraries and prisons got secondhand books passed down. It's not the library that you would go into in London somewhere or New York City or anywhere. It's, it's books that maybe people sold in estate sales and things like that. Sure. So I see this book called Real Magic by Wayne Dyer, which I read because I bought all of his books and read them all. But still, there's those mention of A Course in Miracles. And so I, it was just a welcome to read Wayne Dyer. Just to read him, it was like it, in prison. You, you just don't understand how lonely and how terrible and beat up you are while you're in there. Well, well, that's yep. Yeah. Can we just go back a bit here? I hate to do this. Um, no, go right ahead. Um, 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 but but the, there is a reason for this because obviously, just as as, as a sort of point of loss in a sense as well. I mean, um, I, I read something at the beginning of your book. Um, it was that the last few hours. Of 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 you uh, be, uh, living at the house that you were living at at the time, your own house, yeah, um, yes, and and the feeling that you you knew you were going that Im imminently there was a there would be a sheriff's car at some point tracking you down because there was an arrest warrant out for yourself, and and just knowing that you had to let go in that moment of all the possessions that you had worked so hard towards letting go of family in a sense as well, knowing that, you know, it, you know, some may not come to visit. Um, what was that process like? To, 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 did you, had you sort of prepped yourself really for knowing that you were going to go to prison in a sense? Well, yes, Kevin. I knew that uh, my lawyer had forewarned me that I was going to prison. Of course, we didn't know it was going to be 10 years. And I, I was actually hiding from the police because I needed some time to regroup and, 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 and get some things together and think, well, maybe these finances aren't right, which were minimal. I was really rock bottom, but just time I needed to figure out. But there was also some thoughts going through my mind of, you know, hey, I can't go to prison. Maybe I need to just end my life. And, um, you know, it was just such a depressive state. But I knew there was just something in me that said, just, just keep going, just keep going. And I finally, it came up through me, kind of like some indigestion coming up out of you saying, just, you know, maybe this is what you need to do is go through this pain for a while. And so I let go of those thoughts of that I, you know, of ending my life, which really weren't suicidal thoughts, because we all have those at times, quick thoughts, you know. And um, so I just moved forward and I just decided that I was going to do what I had to do. Yeah. How much um, anger did you have towards people, yourself, the system at the time when, when, you know, heading down this road? Well, I had a lot of anger towards myself, mainly. And now that I look back, you know, hindsight is, you know, we say about hindsight. But at the time, I had a lot of anger about the... Uh, well, of course, I was going through a terrible divorce at the time, too, the nastiest divorce that you could ever imagine, and uh, took me for uh, a lot of money. But see, my focus was always on the money, on the money. That's where the success is, on the money. And, you know, that's really not there. And, you know, that's not where the success is. So to, I guess to answer your question is, is the healing part of what really came through to me is 
I, you know, I, I took a long drive in the car and I, <laughs> I've always been a Billy Joel fan, and I punched in Billy Joel, Keeping the Faith. Actually, it was the Innocent Man CD, and I punched in uh, Billy Joel, Keeping the Faith. I decided, uh, you know, I'd stop into the, the Catholic church where I grew up at and, uh, you know, uh, sit there and listen for a little bit and think about my uh, childhood and everything. But the church was closed. It was closed down. It was locked up for the night. So I figured, <laughs> did God close up shop for the night? So, uh I really, what I did was I surrendered. And you might say, surrender to what? I just surrendered to whatever. I didn't even know what. I just surrendered. Is it giving up? No, it's not giving up. I just surrendered. I knew there was something out there more than just myself. And I just said, whatever it is, I just surrender to you. And that's what I did. Now, obviously, um, you, we, we've just briefly t you, you touched on there just uh, as, as well prior to that, just about uh, the point where you you came across the course in miracles. Um, but you know, just <clears throat> just remind people what life is like in prison in a sense i mean you have no privacy but you know you, you, you when you're using the toilet you use it in front of people do you in almost in a sense you know well that's good i'm glad you brought that up yeah Kevin. i mean just just to, you know what, what i mean what did you you must have lost everything going to prison in a sense well first of all let me uh go back to when i was talking about wayne dyer's book when i returned that book from the library called real magic dr wayne w dyer when I, 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 as soon as I returned the book, went to another section, and all of a sudden, I looked at this uh, blue, this old blue book that uh, was fat and ugly looking, and I pulled it off the shelf, and this is really the way it happened. It fell off the shelf, fell down right between my two legs. I picked it up, and I looked at it, and it said, Faded Gold Lettering, A Course in Miracles. And I just hugged this thing. I was so upset. I said, so, this is what you are, A Course in Miracles. I, I, I can't believe this. After all these years, it took me to, to come to prison to find out who you are. I hugged this thing like you could not believe. I didn't know what was in it, but I knew that I had to take it with me. So I began studying it. So to answer your question there about what prison is like, when I walked back, that's it, I looked over my shoulder thinking, is somebody going to think that I'm excited about this thing that I love and they're going to steal it from me? Because that's what people do in prison. If you love something and you cherish it, they're going to take it from you. Um, so there was a time to answer your question about prison. Yes, it's crowded. It's jam-packed. It's like You're packed in like sardines. You're shoulder to shoulder all day long. It's miserable. It's a living, earthly hell. I was walking to, um, let's just say it was the library, and I, I, I can't really say exactly where it was at the time, but... I was hit on the back of the head because I was walking many places. I was hit on the back of the head with a copper pipe. I went down. Blood was coming everywhere. I just went out, uh, passed out for a few minutes. And there was a guard that came over, saw the guy that hit me on the back of the head. When anything like that happens, both parties go to the hole, segregation or the hole, while they do an investigation to find out what's going on. Well, there was gang activity going on. I was being initiated this guy that hit me on the back of the head was initiating himself into the gang, earning his bones on me. They call that earning your bones in prison. I spent 11 days in the hole while uh, an investigation was going on to make sure that I was not part of a gang, which they clearly found out that that was not the case. While that, during halfway through that 11 day period, I witnessed a murder in the adjoining cell right next to me. And I describe that in detail. I, I want to say it's chapter 15 in my book. And uh, basically what happened was uh, a, a white man, 47 years old, was beaten to death uh, by a young black man. And I say that not as prejudice against blacks or white, but in prison, it's the blacks against the whites. It's the his it was gang activity they were trying to draw me into. I was in a cell by myself. Thank God I was there in my, by myself in that cell at the time when I witnessed this and these two men in the cell together. I prayed the whole time I was in there that no one was going to come into that cell and be there with me. And that wasn't the case. But um, 
To answer your question about prison, yes, when you're on the crapper, so to speak, the toilet, you're elbow to elbow with lines of toilets everywhere. There's no privacy anywhere. You have no private conversations, nothing. Uh, it, it's, um, it's full of extortion, uh, threats, uh, wanting to get you to join a gang. And if you do not join a gang and you decide to go solo, then you get recruited, and if you don't get re- and if you don't follow into their recruitment tactics, then they come at you violently, which could mean a shank to the kidney, uh, and a shank can be anything from a uh, uh, anything that they could actually. There's guys in prison that uh, you call him the shank maker. Who, you, if you need a shank, you can go see him, and he'll make you a shank for protection. Guys carry them in their socks. They carry them in their underwear. It could be a bed spring. It could be a broken mop handle. Anything that they can sharpen all day and to stick in you whenever they want to. Yeah. And really, I'm thank God I never was shanked. No, no. And, 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 and I, you know, it's, it's, you know, I mean... <sighs> You take you take yourself prior back just to 2007 before you know go, going into prison. I mean, you know, this was a foreign language to you right now. This is a language that you've learned to to live with. You know, learn 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 to uh, to survive uh, as such. It's you know, it's it's it, it takes a, you know, it, it must be like a very big readjustment period right now for you. Well, it is, it is, Kevin. And but when I when I came into a course in miracles, and first of all, I want to say that because. Since my book has come out, I've, I've gotten some hate mail already. And A Course of Miracles is what I stumbled into. It's abstract psychological therapy for the mind. It's not a religion. It's not a cult. It's something that someone reads and, and d- interprets their own self-help. And I just decided to write about it. And there are very many uh, famous authors. One of my favorite, Marianne Williamson, who is just doing a tremendous job with the Course in Miracles. Um, yep. But yep. my point is, is that what I'm saying is that, um, you know, coming out, my, I, I, I'm very strong. My strength, because of A Course in Miracles, that does not replace the Bible, because it actually it enhances my interpretations of the Bible when I want it to. So it's, it's not uh, a religion or a cult. It's just psychological data, abstract data that you just decide, that I decided to take in and reevaluate and start writing about. And my gosh, the writing that I've got going because of this is unbelievable, Kevin. Right. But where I'm at now, 90 days being out of prison, my God, I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, in prison, there's no computer. There's no, you know, so I'm getting into this, you know, these Facebook and Twitter and all this and uh, the things that my publisher, who's being very <laughs> yeah. patient with me, yeah. is yeah. demanding on me. And it's just an overwhelmness. See, you people out here that weren't away for eight years, you know, you gradually picked up on these things. You know, gradually they come to you. Oh, I came out. All of a sudden, whoa, it's coming right at me. But it's exciting. And it's making me feel 20 years younger again, like. <laughs> Your age, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just astonished. I, and to answer your question, and really, what my writing has done to me because of a course of miracles is just, it's just taken years off of my life. It's taken the years off of my life that prison put on, and now they're coming back off. Right, right. Well, well, for those who don't know too much about the course of miracle. In miracles. Um, this was channeled information as such, but c- c- can you just sort of explain what what is a course in miracles, um, uh, just briefly for all the audience? Well, a course in miracles was written. Yes, it's channeled information, and you know I like to look at channels of you know there's um, hey channels that um, lead from the mountain streams into the ocean, which is whole. Okay, and. A Course in Miracles was written and uh, started being written in 1965 and was published in 1975, 1976, around there, by Helen Schuchman, a psychologist at Columbia University in New York. And uh, she doesn't take credit as being the author. She takes credit of just the spirit within her that wrote this. And she decided just to call this Jesus, not Jesus the body, but Jesus, the mind that we share, which is 
So where I'm leading to and where A Course of Miracles gets to is like, you know, we're in an ego-based world. The world that we look at is fear, guilt, uh, doubt, and questions. And what A Course of Miracles does is clears those doubts out and lets you know that there's something better beyond, beyond, beyond the guilt, beyond the doubt, and that's wholeness of mind. There's no split apart separateness from your creator, which is who we know is our creator. And um, it makes you whole. And the whole point of A Course in Miracles is forgiveness. Forgiveness means looking beyond the ego that's in us all, looking beyond why we make those mistakes, looking beyond to that point and loving that person beyond the forgiveness. Is it a cop-out? It sure is, only to the ego. But A Course in Miracles is about forgiveness. So anyone that gets involved in it can take it the way they want to take it. That's just my interpretation. Okay, okay. And obviously when reading this book... Um, uh, you, well, you can't just read A Course in Miracles. No, right. You, once you start diving into it, it's just, oh, you'll have headaches and because it's just stuff you can't understand. It's so abstract. Uh, but my material, The Master of Everything, came from the abstract that I turned into the concrete so people can understand Right, right. Uh, that that's yeah, ab absolutely. And this is what you were writing. Um, uh, how uh, healing was was doing this writing? It was it, it almost stripped you away, didn't it, from who you were uh, in, in, into who you are now? Yeah, you're absolutely right, there, Kevin. Uh, with all the events that happened to me in prison, um, first of all, I wrote. Once I stumbled into A Course in Miracles, and I, we never mentioned this yet, but I always wanted to be a writer. I never wanted to go into the financial services business ever. It just became, you know, you pay the bills and you do what you got to do. Uh, but um, the writing that, that, that I've been doing from A Course in Miracles is the healing. It's turning the abstract into the concrete in your mind. And then so your mind can understand what we are really about. We're really all connected together. There, we really are not apart. And, and, and as we die out, our generations move out, and the younger ones are coming in. That's why I said earlier that the younger people are really making a difference in the world. Because look at what's going on with the Internet right now. I mean, I'm so amazed after being away from eight years, eight years of it, that quick, with no computer at all. I see this closeness, this, this wholeness, but if that's the way you choose to look at it, which I do, other people may choose to look at it as though the internet is evil, it's causing problems. Well, that's, so, you know, we have a choice. Are we going towards wholeness or are we going towards more separation? And I see the younger people coming in the way I choose to see it based on what I study and write about is that we are coming more towards wholeness. The ones that feel that we're that we are separate, they're guilty because of that. But we all feel have this guiltiness, guiltness, and separateness in us, and we all have a little bit of guilt. But the other, so you really have a choice in this world. You know, you and I in this interview, we can decide to be whole together and sharing this, or we can decide to be adversaries towards each other and argue towards each other about our points. But we're not doing that because we're trying to do this interview for a common cause, and that is wholeness. There's no separation there. There's no ego involved in this interview with you and I right now. No, that's right. There is absolutely no ego. This is uh, to be of service to people. And ego is, ego is fear, guilt, doubt, questioning. Wholeness is love, moving to the next level understanding you've made mistakes, but wanting to better yourself and wanting to extend yourself 
the light that's in you extends. It doesn't project. The ego projects fear. It projects guilt. It, pro it projects questions and doubt. The wholeness in us extends the light, which in my book I call the spiritual flashlight. Imagine you have a a flashlight in your, I point at my brain, but imagine you have a flashlight in your mind, which is behind the brain. Actually, it's who you are. And you decide when, when these terrible thoughts come into your mind about guilt and feel guilty about this or worrying about the bills to pay, hey, turn on your spiritual flashlight and shine it on these things and just look at it. Don't doubt it. Don't judge it. Don't question it. Just shine your light on it and look at it for a while. And notice it. Noticing what's not right to you heals. Think about when you cut your wrist or your arm. I don't mean cut your wrist. Well, there was a guy in prison that slid his wrist. But think about if you have an accident on the road or something. Sure. You, know, you fall down, you scrape yourself. And the healing, it's the skin comes together and heals. It becomes whole, right? It doesn't stay separate. That's what heals. So the process of healing is becoming whole. And that's what you and I are doing in this talk. And that's what I've done in the years in prison writing the books that I'm writing about, that I'm very excited about. To go on and expand about A Course in Miracles, really the, the only way I can say uh, to really sum it all up, it, it's just so in-depth, it's so deep, is that it's about forgiveness rather than judgment. And I suppose... Uh, there was a lot of forgiveness uh, towards yourself when, when in prison, towards the system, towards family, oh God, towards so many things. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. You're not you're unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> you know, I people wrote me letters that uh, were supportive. Other people wrote me letters that crucified me. And... Um, and I had to look at these letters of cruci you know, the crucifying letters is, I can't believe they're writing me letters like this because I really didn't do anything that terrible. No. That bad. And I looked around prison I'm in with these people that actually literally killed people and brutally raped people. I mean, I was mixed in with all of them in a state penitentiary. Not a federal prison, a state penitentiary, which is ungodly worse because they don't have the funds to, to uh, do the things that need to be done. And um, the only thing I could do was just um, continue my lessons to look beyond that, look beyond the ego, as far as I could look beyond to wholeness. Where is wholeness? If you can't find it, you got to keep looking beyond. Okay, for example, Kevin, it's a cloudy day out here, okay? And the clouds are in the sky, okay? But you know, the sun is up there. It's just the clouds are blocking it. So we can look beyond those clouds and see, hey, the sun is up there. And you know what? If we look beyond those clouds and keep looking beyond those clouds and just notice them for what they are. Don't judge them. Don't get down on ourselves because they're clouds. Just notice that they're there. But say, hey, you know, they're on their way out. All of a sudden they go away. Clear blue skies come about. All right, let me give you an example, Kevin. Think about on a star-lit midnight night sky, moon and all the stars and all its glory. You're out there just in awe looking at the sky, okay? Clear, crystal, black sky up there. All of a sudden, a shooting star shoots across, okay? <clears throat> Where is time going on in your mind right there? It's not existent. Where are you feeling right now? Are you judging that star shooting across the sky? Are you just in awe because, hey, that's what it is and I'm part of it? Have you ever looked, a, say, maybe a wild animal in the eye and they looked at you back thinking like, hey, they're trying to say something to me? In that instant, an instant, that quick. Where is judgment right then? There is none. There is no judgment. It's looking beyond the body, beyond what we are. See, we're so caught up in, in the body as who we are. Sure, we got this body we have to deal with while we're here. But is this really what we are, this body? Because those are the people that are worrying too much about their longevity and their fear of death because... 
they're worrying too much about the body as who they are. If we can look beyond the body, look beyond the body to who we really are, like right now in this conversation as an example, the same as the shooting star, the same as that wild animal we looked in the eye and thought we were getting messages back from, that same thing, but this conversation going on with you and I, where is the body concerned, Kevin, with you and I's conversation going on and all that? It's non-existent, correct? True. There is who we truly are. That is what we truly are. That is the one mind of creation. That is God's mind. Whatever you want to call God, it just that's a name. And in my book, I call it the Christ mind. <clears throat> You can call it whatever you want. It could be Louise, it could be Katie, it could be whatever you want to call it, okay? A word is a word, okay? So the people that get confused about the Christ mind, oh, you're, you're blasphemous towards Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. No, not at all, because the man Jesus had this to share. But in those days, he didn't... Uh, he, he couldn't talk to people this way like I'm talking right now. And, you know, and, and it goes beyond that, too. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Christ that's in us, whether you want to look at Christ as the man Jesus himself, which we are so thought on looking at uh, through the way we're brought up, that's fine. Then that's great. There's, that's fine, because <laughs> that's the way I was raised as a Catholic. That's fine. Look at the face of Christ as the face of Jesus if you want to. That's great. But when you look in the mirror the next time and you look right into your eyes, like you're looking into my eyes right now, look into your eyes the next time you're shaving in the morning, Kevin, or you women out there listening to that, next time you're putting on your makeup, look into your eyes. What are you seeing there that's the real, true you? That's the Christ mind. It's not a body. You are beyond the body. And if you start thinking that way, your fear of the body goes away. So when I was in prison, what I had to do was take my body out of the picture around this volatile, the violent den of the cell block that I was writing in every day. I had to take my body out of the picture. I could not be afraid. I was elbow to elbow. Right, I had my journals that I was writing in. One time I came by my bunk and they were ripped up and on my bed, torn in half, ripped up uh, because people were jealous because uh, so you, you but when you, you got to look beyond that. OK, that's OK. I can rewrite these words again. That's OK. The mind that's behind the body is who we are now. <clears throat> you know, some people believe in UFOs, the UFO phenomena, which is big. Hey, are there UFOs? For me personally, I'm not going to judge where they, wh whether they are or not. But, hey, if the people that see the UFO, it's the reflection that they have of the mind, the Christ mind that they are. It's the reflection of what is real in them that sees this UFO as real. So is it real? Yes, to them it's real because it's not physical. It's something that's coming from them from outside their body. So in that sense, it is real. So, <laughs> you no, know, we, no, these are, these are great answers that, that they really are. And, and um, so many questions are darting through, through my mind right now. I mean, yeah, I mean, that process um, of, of, um, of writing uh, uh, your first book, um, uh, I, I, did you know you was writing a book to begin with? Well, to begin with, no, I didn't, Kevin. I just started writing. I figured, wow, you know, like I already mentioned earlier, Course in Miracles, I knew that I wanted it, you know, all my life. But why didn't I search it out? All of a sudden, it shows up to me in prison. And it ends up I made a, a deal with the library woman there uh, who didn't under a course in what, she said. And so she allowed me to keep the book. Um and, but I've got newer copies since, and I've got this original one that's beat up, nicotine-colored, filled from the ugliness of prison. Oh. <laughs> so, but I started writing. I just figured I'm going to start making notes. I'm going to start making notes. And just something was instructing me, make notes, make notes. But, you know, I had to always, you know, and as I was making notes, 
because th there was the writer in me. In college, I took the literary stuff, and I, that's what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I'd go into journalism, but I never did. And, you know, I was in the military and the Air Force and all these things. You know, I never really pursued what I wanted to pursue. So now here I am in prison. I got nothing to do but elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder with loud, chaotic, violent stuff going on all day long. I said, most of my writing was done on my lap because there was no table to sit at, no desk to sit at. Just I, if I could cross my legs, if there was enough room, the people on either side of me, I would, you know, position a legal pad tablet on and, and write those. And I had a friend of mine that was able to send in these composition journals from the outside that I had to get cleared to the prison department, which they did. And so I, what I would do, my equivalent of computer entry was once I got everything perfected on this legal pads, I transformed them, uh, trans transferred them over to uh, handwriting neatly into composition journals, the kind of like student notebooks that you would use in college, okay, those kind of things. And those were my equivalent of computer entry. Incredible. And when I landed my publisher, Carol, in Sarasota, Florida, that was the letter I had to her, basically what I just said to you in this interview. And she said, send me your stuff. Oh, my God, I got to look at it. And she did. And one thing led to another. But while I was writing, it was elbow to elbow. I mean, violent talk. I mean, uh, threats against your life. Quit writing. They would not want me, and when I say they, the average inmate, they felt threatened just because I was so busy reading and studying and writing every day, they felt so guilty. But that's the collective ego mind. Yes. And yes. I started to understand that in the murder that happened to me in the cell. And that it's the collective, because the ego in us wants to kill us, but he doesn't know who to kill. So psychologically, he kills the body. Sometimes that's suicide. Most often it's murder. And that's where your murders are coming from. from the, in other words, we all have an ego in us, the ego-based mind, I call it. We all hate the real us. But if we can learn to accept the real us over the ego and just notice like I told you earlier about the cloud cover dissipating. If we only notice the cloud cover, not dwell on it, notice it without judgment. So if we only notice the ego in us, that part of us that's judgmental, and, you know, we all have it. But if we can all just, hey, that's just the ego in me. Hey, what are we doing? We're healing. We're accepting the fact that we all have an ego. Oh, that damn ego in me just went off again. Got to get a grip on that. You notice it. Don't judge it. You notice it. All of a sudden, the powerful side of you, the natural side of you, the real you, which can be called the Holy Spirit if you want to, takes over. So you really only have two sides of you. You have the ego, and you have the natural spirit side of yourself. It's one or the other. There's no in between. You got dark clouds, gray clouds, clouds that are dissipating, but they're always clouds, right, Kevin? Right. But of course. clear blue skies are clear blue skies. Well, well. So, okay. <laughs> what is some of the what it, what is some of the uh, If you were, if you had to sum up what you were writing, right? Um, w if someone came across your book, yeah, what would they get from it, in a sense? What information, how, tra <coughs> what, what, what transformative uh, information could they get from from this, uh, but by reading your journey? All right, thanks, Kevin, for bringing that up because that's important. Because my book is very important. My book is for people that are putting things on the back burner, that are judging the cloud cover too much. They're judging their lives as, you know, uh, they got to do what the world dictates, but they really know that they shouldn't be, but they do anyways. It's for people that are lost, like I once was. It's for people that are constantly making mistakes that can learn how to take the energy from those mistakes. 
and turn them around into the spirit side of them and make them powerful things that happen like I did with writing a book that's now going international. I could have stayed in prison for all these years and dwelled on the system torturing me and being unfair to me. I was in prison for eight years, a 10 year sentence. A forgiving judge came out from retirement to let me loose early. Not the same judge that sentenced me. This judge felt because of my accomplishments he needed to let me go. I think because of the forgiveness that I gave to myself and to the world while I was in prison, brought this judge forward to release me in my projections of the way I see the world. A reflection came through in me. But how this can help people is, hey, folks, if you are down and out, you don't know where to go. If you're having problems with your marriage, with your finances, with whatever it is, it's not that you should leave them alone or put your marriage, let, let go of it. No, no, no. You need to look beyond the problems you're having. See, too often we focus on the problems. We stare at the cloud cover. And the cloud cover never goes away if that's all we do is stare on the cloud cover. No, come on. Let's look beyond our problems. Okay, beyond it. Let's not look to the past what brought them on. And beyond doesn't mean the future. It means, okay, what am I about? What is it I really want to do? Let's get this cloud cover out of here. Out of here. Let's redirect our mental power that's leading us into these errors and these mistakes that we make in life, and let's use that energy, which is thought. Energy is thought. Is thought, is all it is. And let's use that thought, redirected, to transform our life and help others. And when we help others, which is what I'm doing with writing my book, it's an extension of me. And when I am extending myself, I am extending my light the natural light that I am, which was passed on to me from, we could say, the woman that uh, is the author of The Course of Miracles. We can say it was passed on from, hey, who knows way beyond me. It's, pa it's an extension, a light beam extension. That is what I am. And I'm just extending that bright as I can so it's bright enough to shine through your cloud cover, people, that need to read this book. And it teaches you, and if you have, and if you're above that, and you have that, and you're beyond the problems, and you really don't have problems in your life, my book teaches you to continue extending yourself. And my God, you know, look at our world leaders in this country. And this, in this world, country, I mean, this world, you know, we are we are just doing the same things as history. History repeats itself. We're not extending. We're also afraid in fear. Let's look beyond the fear. If we all look beyond the fear, if we all decided, hey, let's throw down fear right now. Hey, what do I need to be afraid of? What's the worst that could happen? I run out of money. Well, yeah, but what would happen then? Well. You know, hey, if the world was all didn't have fear, we'd be okay. But there, no, there's enough shelter to house the homeless in the world. There's enough food to feed the hungry. But we're not doing it because we're not looking beyond that fear. Why are we not feeding the hungry? Why are we not feeding the homeless? The homeless and the hungry got that backwards a little bit. Because maybe we're afraid that we might give them what they don't deserve because they didn't earn it or something like that, which is judgment. You know, so we need to go beyond our judgments. But, Kevin, that's not going to happen overnight. And that's what my book helps. So every little fraction of that that a person can take in their life, in their personal life while they're here on this earth, makes them a better person and makes them transform themselves, makes them transcend above the fear. But ultimately, when the, the people that are writing about things that I write about, like some of the ones that I mentioned early that extended on to me and now I'm extending on to others, and by the way, those people still live and keep on writing to themselves. And I, But if we keep that extension going on, we're breaking through the cloud cover. 
of the guilt, the separation, the doubts, the fear. I what? think you're so right what you say. Um, 100 years from now, how much different is it going to be if we continue this extension? Yes. Yes. Yes, and, 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 and we don't want to look into our fears, do we? That's the issue. That's the problem as well. We don't want to face them. And, you know, it's, uh, and for some of the reasons that you've just mentioned there, but it's, you had to, you did. And, and, yes. and, and, and look what it did for you. It got you through the worst point in your life. Well, um, Kevin, it did. You have to look at your fears. I'm not saying that we need to ignore or be in denial. No way. We don't need to deny our fears. We don't need. We have to face our fears head on, but not with judgment. We need to look at our fears. You know, when 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 another incident in prison, when a guy came at me to steal the tennis shoes that my friend sent in to me off my feet, brand new tennis shoes, uh, three uh, uh, gang guys around me, ready to pounce on me if I didn't give them their tennis shoes. I, it's in my book. I stood there, right there, and says, "Hey." You're not getting these shoes off of my feet. I'm not afraid of you. You're going to have to take me down. And I'm not going to fight you back. But if I have to defend myself, I mean, I will run. I got the new shoes to run. Hey, they saw my firmness. I noticed it. I noticed their cloud cover. I noticed it. The first thing they said to me was they were young guys. And in, in prison, older guys are called old school or pops. Hey, Pops, old school. Hey, we were just kidding, man. We didn't mean. We're just kidding. You're okay, man. Hey, you're number one in our book. And they went on their way, mumbling how what a crazy, insane old fool I was. But guess what? There was no violence. The tennis shoes were on my feet. And it was a going beyond fear. It was a going beyond judgment. It was a healing for their side and for me. You faced so, your fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Yeah, facing fear with guns and defense is not facing fear. Facing fear with nuclear weapons, and I don't want to get into politics, and, and nor do any of my books get into politics, because that's not what it's about. But when the only reason I mention nuclear things, well, there we go, we're afraid of a nuclear holocaust someday, destroying the world, right, Kevin? Yeah. What if somebody gets the most powerful weapon in the world and just explodes the whole world up, this earth? It's just gone. Everything's gone, right? Hey, life's not over. <laughs> the earth might not be here, okay? But life is still going on eternally. And see, that's the hard thing that we don't want to grasp, that we don't want to grab onto. What is life? It's a big question mark eternally. They can press the button right now today and we all go up, poof, in a big mushroom and we're gone. I'm not going to see your body. You're not going to see my body. But guess what? We're still living on as who we are beyond the body. Absolutely. This is where we're coming to. It's a transcending, transformational type of growth thing that's coming through people like the people. It's like a procession line heading towards this wholeness to realize this. The people that taught me, that's why I didn't... Um, go out researching A Course of Miracles before I went to prison, I wasn't ready. Yeah. I wasn't ready. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, what a, what a tough lesson to have gone, you know, to, to, to have experienced, you know, having, having to read it um, in, 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 in that, in, you know, in not just that environment, but, but in well, that let me experience give you another example. as well. Let me give you another, yeah. let me give you another example. In prison, <clears throat> I'm laying on my top bunk Double bunks. In other words, you don't have a bunk by yourself. You know, you might see prison movies on TV, and it's not that way. In the United States prisons, you're double bunks, and I was always on a top bunk because I'm more healthy. The healthier one, the unhealthier ones had bottom bunks. So you're, the guy below me was my bunkie. In other words, kind of like your housemate. Your bunk, top and bottom, is considered your house. 30 inches away of space is another double bunk. So that 30 inches between the next bunk is your house. That's where you get in and out, a little locker that you have, you slide under the bed to keep your stuff in, my writing materials and all that. 
Well, I was chilling out on my top bunk one day. Um, I know it was a Saturday afternoon because I remember there was a big uh, Ohio State football game going on. But I had headphones on, and the only way you could escape the noise was headphones with the local jazz station in the, near the city that I was around that had 24-hour jazz music. And I had to have it cranked up because the noise was so loud, even with headphones. I still had to have the volume maximum. These uh, dudes tried to, uh, at, the, at the top rail of my bunk, were uh, doing pull-ups on my bunk, shaking my bed. They couldn't stand the fact that I was relaxing on my bunk. I, I couldn't hand it, handle it anymore. I snapped. I jumped down off my top bunk, and I got right in their face. I says, listen, this, is, this has got to stop. And uh, it almost got violent, but it didn't. And uh, later on, I'm walking in the yard to chill out over this incident where I almost could have had my head bashed on the floor and probably not be here today talking to you because I really was out of line, but I just snapped in a prison environment. So I went to the yard for some relief and started jogging around the yard and it was raining and I was coming up around this concrete bench that's sitting there, which is typical concrete benches, you know, so you can't remove them, you know, it's prison. And here's this guy, Frank, who was the guy doing the pull-ups at the end of the bed. And I'm coming, approaching him, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, don't tell me he's here wanting vengeance on me. So I stopped. He says, hey, waves me over. So I'm ready. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to defend myself here. He says, hey, dude, I just wanted to let you know you passed the test. Keep on going. Keep going. And um, I was just being tested. Yeah, incredible. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, do, you know, under, you know, get my head into a tiny perception of of what it was like. Yet, the, the, writing the book and and it, and it keeping me going, keeping me going, knowing that th this is my purpose, knowing that this the inf information is changing me, knowing that I'm being stripped of everything to 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 become something new. Yet, not wanting to give up, not wanting to commit suicide, not wanting to just end it all. I mean, well. Once I decided to write, which happened, okay, I went to prison in 2007. I ran into A Course of Miracles, like I talked about, almost immediately. Actually, when I was in the county jail, before going to prison, I decided I was going to write about something, but I didn't know. So anyways, I got to prison, and I ran into A Course of Miracles. I decided I was just going to study it for a while. I spent the next six months studying it and making notes. Then I decided... So within that first year of being in prison, I decided to write. So every single day from that point, my writing expanded. All of a sudden, I, one book, I'm like, hey, I, I've got a book going here. Okay, so it led into, so this was like, say, 2007, going into 2008. By 2009, I had my good friend from the outside send me in a, um, a directory, which, long story short, uh, a literary agent that I wrote to out in California from the yellow and 10 year old yellow pages nastily. I mean, was upset. <laughs> she wrote me back and says, Hey, don't bother me. But if you want to look further about your writing, find the writer's market. I didn't know what this writer's market was. So I called my that call and I wrote a letter to my friend, Ron. I says, Hey, can you research this? Just whatever it is, the writer's market, send it to me. I need to get on this. So sure enough, this was the 2008 issue of the Writer's Market, which is a publication this thick, like a big, huge telephone book filled with uh, uh, publishers, literary agents, editors, everyone. So I started looking and reading and studying, and there was tips how to get published and all that. I started reading and studying this and, and getting into it while I was writing. And I decided, well, hey, I need to start finding an editor because I don't have a computer in here to gel my stuff. Meanwhile, while I'm thinking this, my stuff is coming to form where I'm like, hey, this is a good book. Okay, now I'm done with this. Hey, I got a second book coming. I need somebody out there. Well, I wrote the freelance editors, which was Carol in Sarasota, Florida. I wrote to her and she wrote back, which countless rejections before her. It's just that she wrote and it tears in my eyes when I opened this letter and she says, hey, I want to see your material. I sent it to her. So now I'm sitting there in prison. I'm writing every day. So my day in prison 
with instructions from Carol what to do and what to write, but not not instructions from her as far as my hours, as how I was performing. But yeah. I would get up at 5.30 in the morning. Lights went on at 5, 5.15. So, I mean, I would be ready at 5.30. I mean, I was up before that. I'd be up, I'd be ready at 5.30 to move wherever I was allowed to move to within the prison as fast as I could get there to find an open spot to sit and write because it's so crowded and so is everybody else trying to find a spot not to go right because nobody was writing, but maybe to sit and joke around with their friends or whatever, play cards. You, there's no spots to sit at in prison. So I always, I also figured, well, you know what? The worst, if I can't keep my spot for too long where I find a right, I'll just stand at my top bunk, which you stand on your, on your locker box, which is about a foot off the ground. I'm on a top bunk. And my and I would stand on my locker box at the foot of my bed, and my top bunk was my desk. Most of my writing was on the, my top bunk, 30 inches away the next bunk, 30 inches away after that the next bunk, and so on, all the way down, about the size of a gymnasium, 300 people in a dormitory. They called them dormitories. So most of my day, I, stay, I stood on my footlocker and wrote my wow. book. Wow, 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 wow. And, did, and so I got so used yeah. to that. Now, this started in 2008. It went into 9, 10, 11. I didn't find Carol until 10, my right. freelance editor, which I never met, you know, never talked to her. And then it took until 14, 2014, last year, a year ago now, while I was still in prison because I just got out this recent March, where I landed... Uh, <clears throat> Ozark Mountain Publishing Company, who I'm so grateful for, so, so grateful for that they're believing in my work. And um, so, but you in prison, you do what you got to do. It's either that or you deteriorate. And I chose not to deteriorate. Did, 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 you, did you sort of um, find yourself influencing anybody around you with the material that you were writing? And also, did you attract any other sort of, as difficult as this may have been impossible, attract any other sort of spiritually like-minded people in a sense because of what you were doing? Yes, I did. But first of all, Kevin, I didn't share what I was writing about with anybody because you can't share things in prison. Right, because that starts gossip, and then and you just can't. But then on the flip side of that coin too, the more you hide what you're doing, the more they want to know more. So, <clears throat> most of the people in prison deserve to be there, doing life sentences for ungodly, terrible, ugly, just crucial, terribly bad things that they did, mostly murder. But there's a few people that are there, even men that are in for murder that really didn't commit murder, but just were found not guilty by a jury and are there doing life. So we call these, you know, the good guys that we can connect with. Sure, they came around, but the mean, ugly, bad guys that really are the ones that just, the so full of dark clouds, yeah, they wouldn't come around. But a few of them did as they saw some of the older guys because they realized that Hey, I'm doing life in prison anyway. Let's check out what this guy's doing. Well, I knew a little bit about them. So, yes, to answer your question and to make a long story short, because, oh, my gosh, I could write a whole book on that right there. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. welcome them. Hey, come on in. Let's talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. But I never really got into the nitty-gritty about A Course in Miracles. I kept that private because that would have been something that could have been turned against me as evil. Of of course, in a evil, evil environment. Yeah. How do you, how different are you as a person, having gone through what you've been through, having all this experience that you have that most people would never, ever have, you know, get to experience. Who who are you now compared to who you were before? Well, Kevin, I'm really the same person that I was before. I haven't changed. It's just I've changed the way that I'm looking at my own ego and the way that I look at my own spirit. I never understood that before, so I was confused. But if anyone saw me out in public before I went to prison, for example, I played a lot of golf all my life. 
So if I went out tomorrow, which I haven't done yet, but if I went out tomorrow and played golf with my old golf chaps, okay, and they wouldn't see much difference in me, and they would just be patting me on the shoulder, glad to have you back, you know, and I would be the same old guy. But really, with my drive, though, and where I'm going now, the difference is that that people won't really notice is that I know where I'm going. There's no doubts in my mind. There's no questions. There's no having to fake this to, you know, I, 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 tr- I tried to uh, pretend to be a professional in the business I was in. When I really was self-loathing. I, I didn't like that industry I was in at all. And so to answer your question, I'm the same person. There's just less cloud cover. And since I've been out in the last 90 days, some people close to me who still have that cloud cover, they're sensing my light too bright for them. And they're talking some bad things towards me. And I overlook that and look beyond it because it's just cloud cover. They're not handling the light. So I I guess you can say the only difference is that I found the light of myself who I am and what I need to be doing. Yes, yes. And and I suppose it's early days yet, but with what you've done and and and, and the books, the book that you've done now, which is only just just coming out, and, and other books that you've got planned, what do you see as, uh, where would you see this work going? What would where would you like to see it go? as you know you're a master manifester and you can dictate life the way you want how would you want to what would you want to manifest well <clears throat> i see this book the master of everything it's the pilot of many many other books that i've written while i was in prison it wasn't just this book i mean you know you think oh he wrote a book and uh eight years of prison no i mean eight years in prison is a long time day after day I literally wrote every single day, seven days a week. When they came to get me to say they're here to pick you up, I was still writing because that's the vow I made to myself. So the master of everything is the pilot of what I've got to go yet. The second book right now is being, a contract is being signed right now with my present publisher. The third book is being edited right now. And these three books are a tremendous series. The three need to be together. You you can't yeah you can buy one but someone could buy the third book which is which is called and then I knew my true abundance and could read it and say hey this is great but I never read the first book but I still get the third one but hey maybe now I need to go read the first one so you don't have to read them necessarily in order but they are so where I'm going is there's a fourth book there's a fifth book there's a sixth book there's a seventh book and I don't even want to count the numbers on and on because my studies continue daily. So where I'm going with this is I'm writing about things that I see the world opening up to. And when I say the world is opening up to, when I just mentioned to you a little bit ago that some close people uh, said to me, when I, I portrayed it, so my light was too strong for them. In other words, they criticized. I had people, some hate mail on this first book. And there's no way that it's derogatory against anybody, but I've gotten hate mail already from this. And so I see that as positive because that shows the power in this book. And those same people that are doing the criticizing, they're probably going to go ahead and read the second book and they're going to say, hey, now it's making sense. And then the third book and so on. So that's where I'm going. And that's my mission. Go ahead. That's your mission. Yep. I'm going to continue this writing. Well, it's going to lead into, I'm already gearing to speaking globally because uh, I don't know if in your part, well, Toastmasters International is, um, you know, worldwide. I don't know if you know Toastmasters, but since I got out of prison, I had to join Toastmasters. And uh, I'm, I'm even finding it difficult in this little area I'm in to find a good Toastmasters group because I just got out of prison. The judgmental thing. Uh, not the, nothing against Toastmasters. It's just there's so not too many of them around, you know. And um, but that's okay because it's a judgmental world. But the judgmental world, it's just like you know, in this country, when you get out of prison, 
you're marked. You're a felon. Well, it doesn't matter what you did. You're a felon. Oh, he was in prison. Oh, right. Oh, don't talk to him. Don't read that book. He was in prison. Well, you can't let that kind of stuff stop you. No, no. Well, absolutely. And you don't. How, well, how, what would you say, though, is the most important message of this first book? Is it, is it, is it, is it summa- could you summarize it, maybe? Well, this first book is very, very powerful. If a person will read this book from the introduction and take their time and read every single word all the way through, including the afterword, everything. I mean, from the copyright all the way through. What a person will find, and that means, now there's a lot of words in this book. And people have already told me it's a page turner. The pages are being turned. People don't even realize they're turning. It's 320 pages, I think. And there's, the margins are not wide there's a lot of words but it's deep but it's interesting you can't put it down it's going to make a lot of people angry at themselves but it's also going to ultimately show people that they need to forgive themselves so it's about forgiveness and when we can forgive ourselves for whatever we've done Even if we've done nothing wrong, we still have to forgive ourselves because of the deep cloud cover that that we're living in. We need to forgive ourselves for that, and you learn to do that through that book. So when you come through to the end of this book, you have forgiven yourself, you've forgiven the world, therefore you have become the master of everything, is what this book shows you. It's all about forgiveness, this first book. The right meaning of forgiveness. We think of forgiveness as standing over to someone. Someone, I forgive you. You should be glad I'm forgiving you. No, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't have to be something that you share with anybody. It can be just turning your back and walking away from somebody and just saying to yourself, hey, I look beyond the illusion of the cloud cover that's going on in his mind, and I see beyond it, and I'm, I forgive him, and I know he's better than beyond that. But you've got to do that about yourself. So this book is going to help people forgive themselves for not maybe taking chances they should have in their past, not worrying about it, maybe being a better husband, maybe being a better business person, maybe changing careers, Maybe doing whatever it is to make sure you're living in the light that is you, what you want to do that makes you happy. That's what the serious reader of this book is going to benefit from. Okay. Okay. And uh, the fantastic answer. Um, um, and and uh, obviously you're only just, just, just you know, recently out as well. I mean, it, it, obviously adjustments must be difficult, uh, even though, you know, you, you, you've gone through this spiritual sort of, uh, wake up process at the same time so you know you, you've got that on your side but do, do you ever think about the people that you left behind or that were left behind um, in, in prison that you sort of formed a friendship with and stuff like that And um, oh yes yeah, yeah. oh absolutely there's one man in particular uh, Bob initial R um, about 10 years older than me uh, doing a li- uh, life sentence for rape he explained his case to me. He he didn't do the rape, but he was offered uh, four years on a plea deal. And he said, no, I didn't do it. So he decided to take it to a jury trial and uh, he lost in a jury. So therefore, the judge um, gives you the maximum sentence, which was life in prison. At the time he was sentenced, he was 61 years old, which is even older than I am. And this was like 15 years ago. But this man was a corporate man, flew all over the world. Uh, an American man had um, manufacturing uh, plants going on in um, Europe and things and just was uh, doing well and something in his family uh, went on and he was accused of rape he didn't do it and uh, some uh, uh, jealousy thing going on about settling in a state where she thought she was not getting her fair share or whatever and 
And so he took it all the way. They call it to the box, to the jury box, and the jury, you know, found him guilty. Uh, I mean, th these kind of cases go on and on. Another man that I feel sorry for, he's deceased now, which was my really good friend in prison, um, Junior. Uh, everybody called him Junior, and uh, about the same age as me. He was uh, standing at the top of his stairs going down to this basement with his wife, who was eight months pregnant. She was holding a laundry basket in her hand, going downstairs to load these into washer and dryer and do the laundry. And he says, no, honey, I'm going to do it. She was in a bad mood. He was in a bad mood. He grabbed the laundry basket. He told me the whole story and everything. And uh, anyways, one thing led to another. He grabbed it. She fell down the steps. She died. The baby, eight-month-old baby, was died, and he got a life sentence in prison. And he just let his mind go away. In prison, he died of cancer. And I saw him in the, I talked to you about the top and bottom bunks. When he died, he was like five feet away from me and a couple bunks down, just laying there dead when he died of cancer. Yeah. Um, and just uh, one more, one more, uh, another man um, that uh, uh, you know, same thing, went to a trial uh, over a sexual molestation charge, um, which he didn't do, and um, you know, sentenced to 55 years to life, and he was already like 45 years old at the time, in uh, with a stepchild uh, that he didn't do. The ex-wife wanted to be vindictive, but see, these are some of the case, the people that I left behind. But most of them in prison, though, I do need to be there. I mean, there's no doubt. The majority of them do need to be there, but you have the exceptions, and those that were the exceptions, you know, we, we clung to each other, we found each other, you know, um, but even some of the ones that needed to be there came towards us, too. We drew them yeah. to us. Yeah, 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 of course. <clears throat> and they are good people, too, and I can tell you some stories about some actual cold-blooded murderers that... Um, have changed, but you can't let them out of prison because who knows what they're going to do again. And so no, that's another. No, no, absolutely. Right. But 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 it's just the whole thing of you know you you must you know these memories must be fresh in your mind still. You've only just got out. It 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 must be yeah, a, a difficult readjustment to to be out though. But though you know the, those people that you met that are still left in and all 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 the emotions that go with it. Yeah, it must be quite strange. Well, the biggest part, Kevin. You know, eight years. In prison. If it wasn't for the forgiving judge who mm. came out of retirement to let me out early, I'd still be in there because I was sentenced to 10 years. Mm. I actually have two years left on my sentence, which I'm fulfilling on probation. And mm. they see that the material I'm doing and what I'm doing. And this judge that came out of retirement stood in my favor and said, hey, he was over sentenced anyway. Let's get him out of prison and and just let him, you know, be productive and help people. So, you know, maybe I can save people from going to prison. That's the thing. Well, okay, then that's a good point. What would you like? Is that something that you'd like to do? I mean, that you must have. There must be. I reckon there's something for you uh, that, that that maybe has not become too clear just yet. Well, I'm going to go back into prisons and talk to people. All right there we go. Yeah, because my yeah. work is not uh, yet done there. But uh, I can't do it now. I maybe I don't know a time limit, but I need to stay away from going into prisons for a of while. Of course, of course, yes, you know? yeah, yeah. No, but of in course. the future, I'm going to go back in and say, hey, um, you know, I know what's going on, and let me try to make you feel. I, I really want to connect with the guys doing life sentences to make them feel better in prison. Because a lot of good things can happen to people in prison. We can cut down the violence in prisons. We can make prison, uh, it's never going to be a good place. It's never going to be a good place. But we can make life a little bit easier for the ones that want it to be easier, like I did. I mean, I had to struggle to make it easier. But my only choice was to die in there. And so, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Thinking back, you know, it's only been 90 days, and the only thing I can say is prison is hard. It is mind-boggling. It tears at your mind so bad. Um, it, uh, it just tears at you. 
and it rips you apart inside. And by me writing every day and making things manifest, kept the tearing away of things minimal where healing came in. And so I think if more and more people can kind of share this with some of the people doing life sentences, like the ones that are doing it, that went to the box and were found guilty, even though they really aren't guilty, can make them feel a little better, too, in living a life in prison and being productive in a way. There might be some kind of avenue. There might be something there. Yes. You know, for these people. Yes. Yes, that's right. And I suppose, you know, everything's up for grabs for you right now in, in, in that respect of, of, of helping uh, those in, in there in, 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 in some sort of potential. But, of course, for yourself right now, it's a concentration on the books and, uh, you know, to get to get them to get them published. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, well, it's, it's an incredible story, James. I've got to give you that. It's absolutely incredible. And, and it's so great to see you so positive and uh, so so accepting and, and and coming from love um and and, that, and and you 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 definitely emanate that you do um and you coming from that truth that that that, that you, what you of what you've had to learn and 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 re-remember maybe of who you are well it is it is love kevin and truth and you know think about it Love is such a hard thing for people to say to each other. Hey, I love you is a hard thing to say and really mean it. But it's how easy is it for us to say, I hate you? And even in, you know, big families everywhere, the word love really a lot of times doesn't, uh, isn't mentioned that much. Um, but that's changing though and you know and, and like i said earlier I, I feel so strong with this young generation coming in and i, I there's a, something in me that feels that i need to t touch base with these young people coming in and let them see about me when, when i was 25 and you know because i see such i think i see better things in these 25 year olds coming up than hey Look how the world's coming together. Uh, you know, the, the guy at Facebook, Zuckerberg, and, uh, you know, I mean, these guys are young people that are they're doing tremendously good things and they're donating their money away. Who, hey, I don't, I can't remember people bragging about, I'm not bragging, but, you know, I mean, talking about giving donations. These guys are giving billions of dollars away. Things are changing. Things are changing. And I also want to make one point, too. I was in the Ohio State prison system, and which was terrible when I first went in. And a man that came over about my last three, four years maybe in the prison system came in and was appointed by the governor to restructure the prison system. And he has done a tremendous job, a tremendous job in making things so much better, the best that he can. And I saw his changes. I couldn't believe how things were changing so fast. Now, is that my projection? Or maybe did I reflect that? How did this man get there and all of a sudden change these things? You know, see, not that I had the power to pull this man in physically, but it's the mind. See, when we're all sharing the light and extending it, the light extends and it makes things better. We have to keep extending the light just like the prison system is getting a little better. Was it because I was in there? Oh, could be. But could have been from somebody else too. Or maybe a combination of all of us that were trying to extend ourselves. This new governor that took over and appointed him is the, you know, all these things is what's making a better world. And it doesn't happen unless we individually on our own decide to make choices with our own life and extend our true free will what is your true free will what is it that you really want what is it you need to extend that because when you extend that the help will come along it's just like the help is coming along by you in this interview well, I appreciate that, and uh, James, I, I, I really appreciate you giving us your time. We have gone uh, uh, well over time right now, but I wanted to give you the the extra time uh, to to just uh, you know um, uh, give us as much 
detail as you could do about about just uh, your journey and uh, where you where you you know where you see yourself going and where you've come from. And I really appreciate uh, you allowing us to uh, have this interview with you. So I just like to say thank you so much for joining us today, James. Well, Kevin, I thank you. And uh, this interview is uh, doing a lot of healing for me, and I still need to heal because it's so time, uh, you know, since my release. And it's going good, and this just adds to the healing, to the bandages that are on me that are that are healing. And uh, I just I want to make a difference in this world like you are by having this show. And, uh, Kevin, God bless you, and uh, the best to you and your family and your whole world and to the people out there that are watching this show if you'll please just look at me sincerely we all can make a difference in this world by making our own lives better then we can help the world absolutely well much love to you james thank you well we've come to an end on tonight's show don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the more shows official youtube channel Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more on all past and upcoming guests on the show via themoreshow.co.uk and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe.